So for this chest tube series here, I want to do quick reviews over these different disturbances to that normal pleural physiology that we often treat with the chest tubes. The first to discuss here is actually going to be our pneumothorax. All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. My name is Eddie Watson, and my goal is to give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by making these complex critical care subjects easy to understand. I truly hope that I'm able to do just that, and if I am, I do invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon and select all notifications so you never miss out when I release a new lesson. As always, the notes for this lesson as well as all the previous videos are available exclusively to the YouTube and Patreon members. You can find links to join both of those down in the lesson description below. Also, don't forget to head over to icuadvantage.com or follow that link down in the lesson description to take a quiz on this lesson, test your knowledge while also being entered into a weekly gift card. As well as don't forget that you can help support this channel through the purchase of an ICU Advantage sticker. Uh, again, those are found at the website icuadvantage.com forward slash support link down in the description. Now for these lessons it's helpful to have a good understanding of the mechanics behind how we breathe. If you do need a review on this I'm going to link to a lesson up above where I cover just that. So let's actually start off talking about what is a pneumothorax. If we break the word down we have pneumo meaning air and thorax meaning chest and so essentially this is an abnormal collection of air in the chest or more specifically in the pleural space. As you can see here, again, we have our patient, their thorax, and their lungs, the over-exaggerated pleural space here. And so for a pneumothorax, we're going to have this abnormal collection of air you see here. Now, this air in here disrupts the normal relatively negative intrapleural pressure, which is what's resisting that elastic recoil force of the lung tissue, keeping them expanded and against the chest wall. So disrupting this negative pressure, as well as the presence of the air taking up space and putting pressure on the lung, can actually lead to the lung decreasing in size and collapsing. The degree of this collapsing is really what leads to the clinical presentations that we see in our patients. Obviously, a collapsed lung is not going to be able to exchange gas very well. Now, there's a few different ways that we can type and classify our pneumothoraces. So when it comes to how air enters the chest, it can really get there one of two ways. It can either enter from the outside through the chest wall because of some trauma, or it can enter from the rupture of lung tissue and visceral pleura. And then we have a few different types of pneumothoraces. The first type is actually going to be our traumatic. And as the name suggests, this is caused by some sort of traumatic injury. So this can either be blunt or penetrating trauma. And examples here would be like a penetrating stab wound or a blunt injury that causes rib fractures which then damage the lung. But also some other examples of traumatic pneumothoraces would be our iatrogenic pneumothoraces. And so these are going to be the result of things secondary to invasive procedures and surgery. Examples here include like thoracic surgery, lung biopsies, central line insertion can even do this, tracheostomy, or positive pressure mechanical ventilation. And this is actually a really important one for you to know and to be aware of and to be always having in the back of your mind mind because for our patients in the ICU specifically, especially if they're requiring higher pressures and higher PEEP and they have developing either acute or chronic lung disease, that this can become a potential complication. Now, after our traumatic pneumothoraces, we also have our non-traumatic pneumothoraces, and essentially these are going to be our spontaneous ones. And we have two types, our primary and secondary. So for our primary spontaneous pneumothorax, so a PSP, that this can result from normal lung tissue really without any known cause. For our secondary spontaneous pneumothorax, or SSP, that this results from lung tissue that has some sort of underlying disease. So this can be the result of things like COPD, ARDS, asthma, TB, fibrosis, cancer, pneumonia, and even endometriosis, just to name a few. Now, in addition to our types, we can actually classify a pneumothorax in four different ways. We have our simple versus tension and our open versus closed. Now, a simple pneumothorax, that this is going to be one that does not have any shift of any of the structures in the mediastinum. It's essentially just the accumulation of air. For the tension, though, that this type does actually shift the mediastinal structures, and this is going to be something I'm going to talk about more in just a minute here. 
The open pneumothorax is going to be where we have an open wound of the chest wall to the outside, and here air is going to be moving in and out. This is also something that's often referred to as a sucking chest wound. And then finally for the closed, here essentially the chest wall remains intact. So let's actually talk about some of the signs and symptoms of a patient with a pneumothorax. And first to start out, for patients that actually have small primary spontaneous pneumothorax or the PSP, uh, that they can actually present asymptomatic sometimes, or they may exhibit some mild symptoms such as chest pain or shortness of breath. Now for patients that are having pain from a pneumothorax, that this is usually going to be a pleuritic pain. Uh, sharp, it can be severe, uh, it can even radiate to the shoulder on that same side. Now for a patient with a secondary or traumatic pneumothorax, that dyspnea is often going to be more severe. Now along with that discomfort or pain, shortness of breath, and dyspnea, we can also see things like increased respiratory rate, hypoxemia, hypercapnia, subcutaneous emphysema or sub-Q air, we can see asymmetric lung expansion, potentially decreased or even absent breath sounds on the affected side. There can be hyper resonance on percussion, again on the affected side, as well as decreased tactile fremitus and vocal resonance, once again on that affected side. Now if a patient has a pneumothorax that is large enough and a one-way valve exists that's allowing air into that pleural space but not out, it can actually lead to significant impairment of respiration and cardiac function. And this is something that we refer to as a tension pneumothorax, and this one is potentially life-threatening and does require immediate intervention. So here, the pressure or the tension caused by the pneumothorax puts pressure on the mediastinal structures, and this includes the heart and the vena cavas. Ultimately, this can result in a type of obstructive shock that leads to decreased cardiac output and potentially cardiac arrest. Now, if your patient does develop this and they are becoming unstable, make sure that you guys are not delaying the treatment for this, waiting on some diagnostic imaging. This is something that we've got to treat right away, again, because it's potentially life-threatening. And this is also something that can result from mechanical ventilation. So if you have a patient who's on the ventilator and they're sedated, that it may be a little bit more difficult to spot this one, at least early on. We do have some additional things to look for, though, for a patient that does have a tension pneumothorax, and that's going to be things like like tachycardia from the compensation of that decreased cardiac output. We can see tracheal deviation, so this is where it's going to move over to the opposite side that is affected by the tension. We can see JVD. They can have cyanosis, uh, really profound hypoxemia and hypotension, ultimately respiratory failure and cardiac arrest. So now let's actually talk about some of the ways that we can diagnose this. And typically the symptoms that we're going to see for pneumothorax are often going to be vague and inconclusive, especially for patients that have small primary ones. They even may be asymptomatic. And so usually we're going to require some sort of imaging to find and diagnose them. So the first is going to be our x-ray, and really this is going to be our gold standard, and it's something that's quick and easy to do. So here we're going to be doing a posterior anterior or PA chest x-ray, and this is going to be the primary x-ray that we use. Now if we don't observe one on a PA x-ray, but we are still suspecting the pneumothorax, then we can get a lateral view as well. Now usually our x-rays are going to be obtained at the peak of inspiration during that inspiratory pause, but an x-ray at the end of expiration may also be helpful here because the lungs are going to be smaller, because they're more compressed they're going to show up wider, and we may actually be able to visualize the air easier. Also the pocket of air compared to the smaller lungs is going to appear much larger as well. Now what we're looking for really on x-ray are going to be areas where the lung markings are not present. So here's an example here of a chest x-ray of a patient that has a pneumothorax, and I've actually zoomed in here in order to help you to be able to distinguish what I'm talking about here. So if you look on our left, the patient's right, that there's going to be a line demarking the edge of the lung tissue, essentially being our visceral pleura. As you can see over on this side here, we have all of our lung markings, whereas up here it's blank and there's nothing. And this is a little bit easier to see if we kind of compare it over to the patient's other side where you see those lung markings going all the way to the edge here. Now, because air rises, typically we're going to see our pneumothorax being superior and near the apex of the lung, but as the pneumo grows, that it can actually start to move laterally and then inferiorly on the lung as well, depending on its size. Now, also, an ipsilateral deep sulcus sign might also be indicative of a pneumo as well on that side. 
Now, a tension pneumothorax, which here's an example of this here, is actually going to be a little bit more obvious as the lung, as you can see here, is going to be either almost completely or completely collapsed, leaving all of this area here of air. And then we're also going to be able to observe the mediastinal shift and the tracheal deviation away from that affected side. All right, so in addition to x-ray, we can also do the computerized topography or CT scan. Now, the CT scan is not something that we routinely use, but it can actually give us a much better gauge of the location and the size of the pneumothorax. Also, abnormal lung tissue can sometimes appear as a pneumo on x-ray, and for patients that are lying down, which is oftentimes going to be a lot of our patients in the ICU, that the pneumos can be missed as well on x-ray. And so our CT is going to be much more sensitive for identifying the pneumothorax. As you can see an example of this here, it's pretty clear, pretty obvious. The black area is going to be where the air is, and it's going to be really obvious on the CT compared to an x-ray. And then lastly, we have our ultrasound, as this is actually a pretty quick method for checking for a pneumo, and is pretty helpful in cases of trauma or emergency situations, and it may actually be more sensitive than a chest x-ray as well. All right, so now let's talk about our different treatment options. And the treatment options really are gonna depend on the size of the pneumo as well as the associated symptoms. So first we have our conservative treatment, and this is really gonna be for those small primary pneumothoraces that are really asymptomatic. And in these cases, we're really just gonna watch and keep an eye on them. One of the things that we can do is actually deliver oxygen therapy, and this is helpful in resolving these. Um, we do have studies that show the benefit of resolving these pneumothoraces quicker, and really the thought here is that by delivering the oxygen that's going to create a higher partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli, this is going to create a pressure gradient of nitrogen, which is the most abundant component of air, and that's going to help to draw that nitrogen out of the pleural space back into the alveoli, helping to resolve that pneumo thorax. Now another potential treatment option is going to be needle aspiration. And so here for our larger primary or primary that has the shortness of breath or the moderately sized secondary pneumothoraces that needle aspiration might be something that we consider, but this really isn't something that's commonly performed for hospitalized patients. So then from here we have the chest tube. And this is really the gold standard for treatment of pneumothorax. And this is especially going to be true for the larger pneumos, as well as those that are associated with symptoms, including our tension pneumo. Now, when it comes to tension, we can also do something called needle decompression. And this is if we're unable to get a chest tube placed quickly. But again, this usually isn't something that's commonly done in the hospital setting. Now, when using a chest tube for pneumothorax, typically we're going to insert it slightly higher, and this is going to be in the fourth intercostal space, and this is usually either mid or anterior axillary line, and then typically they're going to be inserted going superiorly. And then for our spontaneous pneumos, uh, usually a smaller size chest tube is used, so something like a 14 or 16 French. And then for our traumatic pneumos, here we're going to use a little bit larger of a chest tube, and typically this is going to be like 24, 26, 28 French, something like that. And then oftentimes we are going to have the chest tube to suction initially, which is going to help to resolve the pneumo a little bit quicker. Now, real quickly here, one thing I did want to mention was our treatment for the open pneumothorax. And this is typically something that you're just going to see if you're working in the ED or like in a trauma bay. But this is essentially for the sucking chest wound. We've got that air that's being pulled in with each breath. And so we actually have to get this sealed off. And the way we do this is with some sort of occlusive dressing that we're going to tape down on three sides. And essentially, this is going to seal off the wound on inspiration, but still have the fourth side that is available for air to escape on expiration. And then ultimately, we're going to wait for surgical repair and then chest tube placement to be achieved. And then finally, our last option for treatment is really going to be surgery. And so sometimes we have a pneumo that just doesn't resolve and we have a continued air leak. In these cases, a more invasive measure is going to be needed. And this is also the case for some trauma-related injuries as well. And so here, your patient may need to go to the OR for a thoracotomy. Now, this can either be an open thoracotomy or a video-assisted thoracotomy, or a VAT, which has the benefits of smaller incisions and a little bit quicker recovery. That said, our outcomes tend to be a little bit better with the open thoracotomy. Now here, during the thoracotomy, the site of the air leak can be identified and a repair can be attempted. And this may also involve something like a pleurectomy, so this is where we strip the pleural lining and or a pleural abrasion. 
The point of doing these two things is that during the healing of these, the lung is going to adhere to the chest wall temporarily, and this is going to temporarily eliminate that pleural space and then really sealing off the source of the leak while it heals. Pleurodesis is also something that can be performed, and this is essentially permanently eliminating the pleural space and attaching the lung to the chest wall. So this can be done during a thoracotomy, but if a patient does have a chest tube in place, this is also something that can be performed by administering different agents, such as talc, through that chest tube. All right, and that was our review of the pneumothorax. Uh, I really hope that there was some good information here for you guys, that you guys have a little bit better understanding of what this is, how it comes about, how we diagnose it, and ultimately what we do to treat it here. So I hope that you guys found this information useful. If you did, please leave me a like on the video down below. Uh, it really helps YouTube know to show this video to other people out there, as well as leave me a comment down below. I love reading the comments that you guys leave, and I try to respond to as many people as I can. Make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And a special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you're willing to show me and this channel is truly appreciated, so thank you guys so very much. If you'd be interested in showing additional support for this channel, you can find links to both the YouTube and Patreon membership down below. Head on over there and check out some of the perks that you guys get for doing just that, as well as check out some of the links to other nursing gear, as well as some awesome t-shirt designs I have down there as well. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson that I release. Otherwise, in the meantime, here's a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.